welcome again to my class. And today we will start our conversation about Yak Derrida. I have decided to divide this lecture into two parts. Today we'll talk about just a brief introduction to Derrida himself and also uh, to his concept of deconstruction and some basic ideas. And then in the next lecture, I will delve deeper into the excerpt that uh, I had given to you about Plato's Pharmacy, a chapter from Derrida's book. I will also post the link to it to the website as well as to the description of this video. So just uh, by way of a brief introduction then, um, of course, we all know that Derrida is a French philosopher. Now for this particular lecture, I am taking most of my materials from the Stanford Encyclopedia of uh, Philosophy. And they have a wonderfully detailed entry on Derrida, especially on his mode of thought and his you know, method of philosophy. So I strongly urge you all to read it. And I've gleaned just basic biographical details from there. So Derrida was born in 1930 in um, Algiers. So remember Algiers until the late 1960s, now called Algeria, was a French colony, but it had a peculiar status. And that was that the French never thought of it as a colony. There were about 2 million French European settlers in Algeria, and they considered Algeria or Algiers to be an integral part of France. That's why the independence struggle of Algeria became so problematic for de Gaulle and others, right? Uh, it was French Algeria was also rich because the, think of the people, Camus comes from there. I think uh, Althusser partially grew up there. Derrida comes from there. And then of course, Fanon, Franz Fanon goes and lives there. So he were, Derrida was born there in 1930. And then um, he had interest in learning philosophy. And then after World War II, he decided to study philosophy and he moved to Paris. Uh, you now all French universities have an entr entrance exam. So he took his entrance exam once, but he failed, he didn't make it. But he made it a second time, and that's when he joined the university in 1952 to study philosophy. Now, this is also uh, an interesting time because this is that time when the French philosophy, you know, is at, at its peak. So, so the people that he encounters while studying are all the people that we talk about. So there is, you know, Guy's Deleuze, there is Foucault, Althusser, Leotard, Barthes, uh, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre, right? Uh, Lévi-Strauss, Lacan, Ricoeur, all these people were at the university when Derrida goes to st study there, right? And Derrida's, one of the directors of Derrida is Jan Hippolyte, who was also Foucault's director. And then towards the end of his um, doctor career, De Derrida also studied with Foucault. So not only is that he's lucky enough to study philosophy, but he's studying it at a time when amongst the people who are the big names of post 1960s French philosophy, right? The new philosophers. Now remember, these are the people that Kristeva calls the incorruptibles, right? They are incorruptibles because they, they, they all are trying to philosophize differently, challenge the assumptions and Derrida becomes a part of that whole generation. So, Throughout 60s, after he was invited by young Hippolyte and Althusser Derrida, taught at the uh, Encore Normal, right? And in 1983, he became the director of studies of philosophical institution that taught social sciences and philosophy, and that he held that position until his death. 
Sometime in 2002, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he died on October 8, 2004. So that's brief life, but uh, what a life it has been. Now, I will move on to, and this all comes from Stanford uh, Encyclopedia, by the way, on what they describe as Derrida's basic style of argument. And I'm going to read from this slide, which it says is that the basic arg argumentation in Derrida always attempts to show that no one is able to separate irreplaceable singularity and machine-like repeatability into two substances that stand outside of one another nor is anyone able to reduce one to the other so that we would have one pure substance, right, with attributes or modifications. And then machine-like re repeatability and irreplaceable singularity for Derrida are like two forces that attract one another across a limit that is indeterminate and divisible. So what does he mean by that? So, I'm gonna to go to their explanation of it. So they give us an example, right? Um, for example, this difference between a pure substance and something that is opposed to it, right? Can there be a pure substance or a pure idea? That's the question that Derrida is talking about. So generally speaking, it's a level of the sign, right? Writing, speech, writing, right? Being, presence, absence. And what he's saying is, so the example is if we reflect on experience in general, one thing that comes to our mind is that experience is conditioned by time, right? Now, every experience, right, takes place in the present. And so that's why we can call it an event, right? And so that's a pure form, an event, an experience. But what Derrida suggests is that since experience is in time, the moment we are experiencing an experience as an event, it is aware of its immediate past, right? That past which is absent, but it is present in the experience and it anticipates a future, right? So if there is a past to an event and a possible future, that means the event is repeatable, machine-like repeatability, right? If it is repeatable and can be in the past, can anticipate a future, is it really a pure event, right? So part of what Derrida will then say is that there is a trace of the present and the future, a trace of the past and the anticipated future in the event itself, right? And this is what he calls the trace, the concept of the trace, right? We discussed it in our class in terms of a semiological chain, right? When we read a semiological chain, this is a cat, that's an event. When I am at this, right, that is an event, but it has what was before that sentence in it, right? And this is what he later theorizes also as difference right? Meaning is always deferred to the next sign, right? And meaning is always through difference. So the basic style of argument is he will pick up two concepts, right? In which one claims to be the main concept and the other not so pure, right? And he will try to then suggest as to whether or not that concept that claims to be pure, like experience itself, can really be pure. So that's kind of the first movement, right? In his style of argument. Then I'm trying to locate my slides here. I think I lost them. Um, all right. Then he goes on to 
So the, the writers at the Stanford Encyclopedia give us an example of a classical Derridian argument. They say, uh, and I just talked about it, and I, I'm going to read the slide. If we reflect on experience in general, what we cannot deny is that experience is conditioned by time. Every experience necessarily takes place in the present. In the present experience, there is the kernel or point of the now. What is happening right now is kind of event, different from every other now I've ever experienced. Yet also in the present, I remember the recent past and I anticipate what is about to happen. The memory and the anticipation consist in repeatability. Because what I experience now can be immediately recalled. It is repeatable and that repeatability therefore motivates me to anticipate the same thing happening again. Therefore, what is happening right now is also not different from every other now I have ever experienced at the same time. The present experience is an event and it is not an event because it is repeatable. This at the same time is the crux of the matter for Derrida. The conclusion is that we can have no experience that does not essentially and inseparably contain these two agencies of event and repeatability, right? So the binary structure of the event being isolated and unique is ruptured. So the concept of the trace is the present, therefore, is always complicated by non-presence, what is past and what is being anticipated in the future. So this is the reason they are giving us this basic example of Derridian argument is because this is what Derrida does in most of his work, which eventually becomes deconstruction, right? Picking up these fixed ideas, which he calls the metaphysics, and we'll talk about it in a minute. And then taking the grounds upon which that metaphysics is established, right, and normalized, and then working through it, right, destabilizing it. And that's what eventually becomes deconstruction, right? Now, for deconstruction, initially the term was used by Heidegger, which he calls destruction, right? And a lot of people attribute it that the even Spivak in her introduction to of grammatology dwells very highly on destruction, the term that Heidegger uses. And she also explains, and I strongly urge you to read that introduction. She also explains uh, how Derrida and even Heidegger use the term, which Derrida calls sous erasure, under erasure. I can't say it in French. So what does it mean? What it means is that when we are employing language and we know that the sign is not stable, it does not mean what we, it doesn't carry all the meanings itself, but we still use it. So the practice that Derrida then adopts is, is by literally crossing out a sign which says, this is a sign, I'm using it under erasure, knowing that it doesn't carry everything that's associated with it, right? And so that comes from this practice, right, of destruction from Heidegger. But the editors of Stanford Encyclopedia also suggest that part of the motivation in Derrida comes from Descartes, from the first meditation. And how does the Cartesian meditation start where Descartes is saying, I just realized that my former beliefs were imperfect or mistaken, and I now want to rethink my thought, right? To give it a firm and permanent foundation. And the image of a foundation implies that the collection of his former beliefs resembles a building. So in the first meditation then, Descartes in effect is taking down this old building, deconstructing it, right? So what we can extrapolate from this is that deconstruction, you don't just do it 
you know, randomly, you go and pick up the most enduring structures and edifices of a culture you know, upon which the logic, the entire civilizational structure is built, right? Because those are the foundational structures in philosophy, in thought, in language, in literature, right? The hierarchies that are established, right? And you take those foundational hierarchies and you deconstruct those. Because when you do that, you can change a culture, you can change a politics. So that's where the term deconstruction comes from. Now Derrida himself gives us three definitions over his career that the editors of Stanford Encyclopedia have explained and I'll deal with those in the next few minutes. So the first definition by Derrida they say appears in 1971 interview in Positions and in the 1972 preface to Dissemination. Dissemination is the book from which Plato's pharmacy is excerpted and which we will be reading for our next class, right? Deconstruction consists in this form in two phases, right? Simply, deconstruction is a criticism of, of Platonism, which is defined by the belief that existence is structured in terms of oppositions. And this is Platonism, Platonism, right? Coming from Plato. Separate substances or forms, and that oppositions are hierarchical, with one side of the opposition being more valuable than the other, right? So think of it, presence and absence, right? Um, body and spirit, right? So these are the original hierarchies that come to us through Plato. The first phase of deconstruction attacks this belief by reversing the, the Platonist hierarchies, the hierarchies between the invisible or intelligible, the visible or sensible, between essence and appearance, between the soul and body, between living memory and rote memory, right? Uh, we, we, between speech and writing, right? Um, but how do these hierarchies get established? How do the first principles get established? And about that, Derrida says is that 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 something. It's like we can see that something like a decision, perhaps an impossible decision must have been made at the beginning of the metaphysical tradition, a decision that instituted the hierarchy of essence, appearance, and separated essence from appearance. This decision is what really defines Platonism as metaphysics. So metaphysics is, metaphysics then is this establishment of these binaristic almost hierarchies, right? And that is what he calls the platonic metaphysics, right? So the first movement is to juxtapose the two oppositions next to each other, as he does in of grammatology, speech versus writing, right? And then, you know, suggest in the first phase that maybe this is not the first cause or the first you know, the, the privileged part of this binary, maybe this is, right? So you prove that first, right? And then in the second phase, in the second phase then, the previously inferior term must be reinscribed as the origin or resource of the opposition and hierarchy itself. How would this reinscription or redefinition of appearance work? Here we would have to return to the idea that every appearance or every experience is temporal. It's in time. In the experience of the present, there is always a small difference between the moment of nowness, right, and the past and the future. This, this small difference is not only a difference that is non-dualistic, but also it is a difference that is, as Derrida would say, undecided. Right? So what does he mean by it? 
that as we are thinking a dualistic concept in which this binary is already established, man, woman, at the moment of now, when we think of one aspect of that binary, right? When we are neither here nor there, it is that moment in which the sign is neither this nor that. It's undecided, right? Some hierarchy, some outside system decides it. So in the second phase, first we have decided that not this part, but this part is the originally part of a binary structure. And secondly, we reverse it and we say this actually precedes the other. And we do that by dwelling at that moment when the sign is neither this nor that. This is what we call the Rida putting the sign under erasure, that in the process of signification itself, there is this moment of the present, which is neither past nor future and not also not the present where that intervention comes in. Um, okay, so I have a, I got a text. She has to watch the stream on her phone today, but YouTube, okay, I'm sorry. So yeah, you can pass the comments to her. Thank you. All right, so moving on to uh, next slide. The, and that is the second definition. And this comes, uh, this is more of a political, and it comes in an essay, Force of Law. So here Derrida says that deconstruction is practiced in two styles. On the one hand, there is the genealogical style of deconstruction, which recalls the history of a concept or theme. Earlier in his career, we know in off grammatology, Derrida had laid out, for example, the history of the concept of writing. But now what is at issue is the history of justice. On the other hand, there is the more formalistic or structuralist style of deconstruction, which examines a historic, a historical paradoxes or aporias. So the second form of deconstruction then is you go into a text, right? And you look at its aporias, the the unanswerable questions, the irresolvable questions, right? So in philosophy, an aporia is a philosophical puzzle or a seemingly insoluble impasse in an inquiry, often arising as a result of equally plausible yet inconsistent premises. So when he talks about justice, right, the aporia there is, is that, you know, what is justice? Right, and then if it is accomplished, do have we really accomplished it? Because, you know, there is no way where we can. Let's say, and I'm just uh, thinking for myself. This is not coming from Derrida. That can can we really do justice? Similarly, uh, there is a brief pamphlet about cosmopolitanism and uh, forgiveness. Right. So the aporia there is that. In order to for forgiveness to be truly forgiveness, right? We must forgive what is unforgivable, right? Because what is forgivable is already forgiven. But the moment at the very instant when we forgive what is unforgivable, doesn't it become forgivable? So can there be true forgiveness, right? That's, that's reading an aporia, right? Now, remember, aporia in philosophy is defined slightly differently. In rhetoric, the operatic mode of asking a question is when, uh, a, a the, uh, when a rhetorician actually invents a question, right? Reads a text and creates a question and then answer it. Sometimes it's probably done playfully, but the questions are created and invented by the rhetorician himself. But more importantly, as it comes to Derrida, the definition of aporia in philosophy is, you know, looking at a concept which either exceeds its own meanings or cannot really be fully grasped, right? So the first one was that you look at the binary structure of the metaphysics, Plato or anyone else, and you challenge and suggest that actually the inferior part of the binary is superior. And then you infuse the 
then you go and read the ambivalent state, the undecidable moment of the binary structure. The second definition is encountering a text, finding whatever is irresolvable in it, what is whatever is operatic, right? And then teasing out those aporias. That's the second definition. And the third definition comes, uh, uh, you know, towards the end of his life, which he gives in 2000. And what he says is, this is Derrida saying, what do I do when I do deconstruction? So he says, each time that I say deconstruction and X, right? This is the prelude to a very singular division that turns this X into, or re rather makes appear in this X an impossibility that becomes its proper and sole possibility with the result that between the X as possible and the same X as impossible, there is nothing but a relation of homonymy, a relation for which we have to provide an account. For example, here, referring myself to demonstrations, I have already attempted gift, hospitality, death itself, and therefore so many other things can be possible only as impossible as the impossible that is unconditionally, right? So where do we go? Okay, so still there, the important part here is that there is still deconstruction is still dealing with indeterminacy, right? So how? Okay, so when we go to um, Plato's pharmacy, which we'll be discussing uh, the question that he's trying to ask in there. There are different questions, right? But one of, one of the things he talks about is in the process of reading a text, right? Derrida is also teaching us how to read a text. So if you look at the text in the beginning says, just at the moment, right? When we have declared an anatomy or a physiology of the text, the text escapes us. And that's a dig at Northrop Fry, of course, the system of systems, right? And then he goes on to tell us that our text can carry a secret, right? For centuries. But remember, Derrida also believes there is a thing called auto-effectivity, right? Auto-effect. So what does that mean? And that comes from, I think also from Plato, this, this idea of the first cause, like why the God is the thing that thinks itself, right? It can affect itself, right? And I myself can affect myself because I think myself. But Derrida's point is that there is a moment of undecidability when I think myself, I think of myself as the other, right? And and so that's that is that that auto effectivity affecting myself from within even presupposes another, right? So in reading then what he's saying is that reading of a, a text carefully is like reading the weave of a fabric, like, and he uses the, the terms like the vocabularies of textile there, right? How? So an act of criticism or critical reading, what he says is, is not embroidering upon the text. Because if you embroider upon the text, you brought something from outside and embroidered it. But to look at the texture of the text itself, to find its weave, right? And only then find that one spot of the text, the navel of the text, right? And unravel it, follow the weave, right? And he does that in Plato's pharmacy by following one word, one term and its derivatives. And those are the concept called the pharmacon, right? We'll talk about it next time, right? And he runs it through that. At stake in that essay then is not just reading one dialogue by Plato, right? But the question 
in Platonian metaphysics of the primacy of speech over writing, right? Why? Because what was believed was that the speech has direct connection to the logos. So in a way, it is the child of logos. It is one remove from the ideal form. And when we speak it, right, we are drawing from that. And two, we are present there. So we control our dialogue, right? What Derrida is saying is, first of all, speech, even within the works of Plato himself, is not always a cure. It's not always pure. And then he cites from the quote where, you know, even Socrates, the mouthpiece of Plato, is blamed for having a voice that bewitches that, that depicts him as a sorcerer. So the speech itself becomes a pharmacon. It can be good, it can be bad. But beyond that, that writing itself precedes speech. Because, you know, when we think, how do we think? How do we know our own thought in script? Who decides that speech is superior the god, the sun king, right? And, and so we'll go into that detail. But, but what he then is doing is he will read an entire oeuvre of a scholar, right? But for philosophy to do its work, for criticism to do its work, what he is then suggesting is that the work is offering itself as complete, as logical, as whole. We cannot find its secret, right? We cannot reveal its secret by bringing something from without and applying it to the text. What most of us do, what I've been trying to teach you to do, right? Use feminism, use Marxism, right? We do that all the time. What Derrida is saying is, no, you must find the weave, the texture of the text itself and unravel it from within, right? Now, why is that crucial? Why is that important? Think of it this way. Um, we have not discovered Foucault, dis discussed Foucault, but I mean, think of the theory of discourse. If everything is built on discourses, if we go by uh, my earlier discussion of Foucault, where he talks about metaphysics, how is a metaphysics established, right? Someone somewhere in the beginning of time decided man is superior to woman. That is a metaphysics, has had been a metaphysics for centuries, right? You can come from outside and keep saying, no, it's not true and all, until you demolish that metaphysics from within, first by proving that there is ambivalence. A man is not necessarily always a man. Woman is not necessarily always a woman. By first suggesting that maybe woman is more essential than the man, right? You so unstabilize that binary structure of oppositions. And then in the second movement, you go and prove how women are actually superior to men, right? Whatever. When you have dismantled that metaphysics, only then can you change the system. And this is crucial in uh, not just in deconstruction. A lot of people from other branches of knowledge has, have already told us. For example, I often cite my former colleague and friend, Mark Brocker, who is famous for a lot of his work on Lacan, but most importantly, one of his books, Radical Pedagogy, right? In which he is also talking about how to give an education to our students where they feel protected, their identities are protected, but then they also develop empathy. And in order to do that, then we have to work through from within their episteme, right? So if they already walk into a class with a fragile identity, right, afraid that I will, the teacher will challenge their identity, will say things or make them do things that doesn't cohere with their self, right? they will shut you off. You will have no impact, no matter how many speeches you make, no matter how many ideas or facts you share with them, because they see it as their threat. So what needs to be changed then is the schemas upon which their self is built, right? And those schemas, just like 
dismantling a discourse, dismantling an episteme, can only be altered in a way from within and through care and compassion and love, a kind of pedagogy that relies heavily on empathy, that encourages empathy for characters in a book, right? For stories. So, so much can be built on this. So, you know, uh, okay, Dalton, I, I saw that. I don't know what that means, but here. So that's uh, all I have to say by way of introduction. Some of the concepts to keep in mind is the three definitions of deconstruction, the, the, the prob problematics of aporias and how to handle them and deal with them. That most of the time deconstruction is another form of close reading from within the text itself, right? But reading that moment in a text where the text doesn't even fulfill its own logic, right? And when you do that, when you unravel it, right, you have deconstructed a text. And in the process, you will build something new. And that's exactly what Derrida does with most concepts in most of his life. So, they, so that's why a lot of philosophers, uh, especially analytical philosophers, didn't even consider Derrida a philosopher because they thought he was a literary critic. But, you know, there is philosophy, which talks about fundamental questions, and then there is letters, there is literature. And Derrida dealing with language, criticizing Saussure, right, Althusser, and Plato, of course, does that from within their own texts, right, by making what has been offered as concrete by making it undecidable, by making it, um, I mean, I don't know, fluid, right? And that is an act of deconstruction. These are some of my ideas. Now, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, we will be talking next week, actually in the next class session, uh, briefly about Plato's pharmacy and you should have the excerpt. I will post the link to it down below this video as well, as well as on the website. Now, a brief introduction to Plato's pharmacy. It's a chapter from Derrida's book, Dissemination, right? And the question that he's trying to answer in the book is connected to some of the statements made by, uh, you know, Socrates, within the text of a dialogue called the Phaedrus. Now, sadly, they've changed the excerpt. The previous excerpt, uh, excerpt, I think, was better. So what the argument is that the argument is the question of writing versus speech, right? But what he's saying in that essay is that he will address that question of writing versus speech using the text of Phaedrus. And in the earlier version of that excerpt, what we were told was that he's not going to the obvious text in Plato's Ouvre, which is the statesman where the question of writing is put to rest, right? So uh, technically then what he's doing is he is picking up a dialogue of Plato, which has always been considered suspect. Some Critics and philosophers thought Plato was too young when he wrote it. Some thought he was too old and senile when he wrote it. So he's picking a work peripheral to Plato's dialogues, all the established dialogues. Within that, he's picking up the term pharmacia, pharmacon, which no one has talked about before, right? Which is on the borders of it. But then he's picking that term and pointing to the particularities of this dialogues, things that are absolutely unique to this dialogue, right? And then running it through the entire text. And so in a way, the essay or the excerpt is a great example of how to do deconstruction, okay? So in the essay, I noticed that Derrida comments on the ideas of Rousseau, but I'm struggling to understand what exactly about Rousseau's work he was commenting on was Rousseau. 
not necessarily. Let me go here. I had put it up here. Uh, you know, uh, his critique of Rousseau. Okay, I'll find the exact spot where he does that. But we already know that he's critiquing uh, Plato, you know, for his reliance on essences. And I will find which particular aspect of Rousseau is he. Uh, I can't recall it right now. And I will incorporate it in the next lecture. Would you consider Derrida to be deliberately writing in style, or do you think his writing style is intentional? I don't know. I mean, the, the Derrida would be, uh, as a philosopher, he would be the one who's who never who who refuses to oversimplify his vocabularies and his writing style. But his writing style is also uh, uh, more uh, writerly, it's more creative, it's, it has flair, right? And it, it, it laughs, you know, it makes fun uh, of things. So it's like he is kind of the most writerly of writers in a way. He relies on puns in French language. He absolutely loves the French language, right? And so I would say not intentionally being uh, being obscure, but not worrying about absolutely making his work transparent in any sense of the word. Right? Uh, okay, you come up with another question. I'm going to look up uh, where I had stored by what part of I know what he's criticizing in Rousseau. But, Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I just found an essay which says Derrida is a philosopher whose text may seem more literary to some than philosophical. Uh, so yeah, than philosophical. Uh, there's another important reading of Derrida by um, Gayatri Spivak right, in Can the Subaltern Speak? A lot of people don't even go there when they discuss the essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? And, and what is important there is that Spivak is, is saying that Derrida is more useful to post-colonialists, to people who work on the margins than Deleuze and Foucault. And there is a reason for it. And she's referring to the famous Foucault and Deleuze interview. What she's saying is that what Deleuze and Foucault are doing in the process of thinking the subject who speaks, the subaltern subject, they universalize it, they Europeanize it, right? So they approach the other through assimilation, right? Make it part of their own. Whereas Derrida throughout his career as a philosopher is always aware of the other, the unassimilable other. Right, other is because he was also a big fan of Levinas, right? So the other is already there, already accounted for, already haunting the sign system, right? And that is the ethical responsibility of a philosopher to know, right? To be in communication with the other. And that is why Spivak thinks that as an ethical philosopher, this this absolute acknowledgement of the other without assimilating it in that non-Hegelian fashion is, is important in Derrida. And that is a good passage to read. I think it's part three of the essay in the subaltern. Um, do you think Derrida if they use deconstruction, the absurdist like Sartre and Camus, I was wondering how one deconstructs a word that is trying to refute the idea of meaning. I don't know if he has any specific things on those authors, right? Or if he did, because I have not obviously read all my Derrida. Uh, but um, what is 
he has a wonderful reading of Hamlet, right, in uh, his book, and it's towards the end of his career, not towards the end, but uh, post the fall of Soviet Union, there was a conference on Marxism where he reads two papers, which was eventually uh, published as Spectres of Marx. And that's where Derrida theorizes the concept of the specter and the revenant, right? And that he takes from uh, Hamlet. And it's a wonderful reading of Hamlet, especially the line, time is out of joint. So I strongly recommend it. But I'm not sure if he actually read any of the other uh, uh, writers. Now, remember the, uh, that any absurdist or non-representational writing would already fall into postmodernism. And Derrida is one of the postmodernist philosophers because he's not giving us a total system, but rather even deconstruction itself is attacking at certain points of a text, right, to unravel it. Uh, famously, his critical essay of history of madness for which he and Foucault, I think they never spoke to each other afterwards, uh, was reading a few passages in a 700 page book, right? Uh, Foucault's claim about Descartes sending off uh, madness, which Derrida says cannot be a send off. And Foucault's claim that he wanted to make madness speak for itself. And what Derrida suggests is that the only reason madness cannot speak for itself is because it is madness. So if, if we declare that I am going to make madness speak for itself, it's actually reason masquerading as we can, uh, madness. So those are the texts that he has read and written about, right? But I'm not sure if he read any of the absurdist works and wrote about them. Okay, so um, I will answer your question, Aaron, in the next lecture. But for right now, this is all I have. So a brief introduction of Derrida himself, his methodology or his method of arguing from within a text, working with the binary oppositions, finding the undecidable part, reversing sometimes the binary structures, and then the three definitions of deconstruction that he himself gives. Now, Eagleton's book, if you've read it, would, you know, Eagleton tells us that in American Academy, by and large, uh, but the, the kind of deconstruction that is done is that is just declaring everything undecidable it is not the kind of deconstruction that Derrida would have agreed with, right? Uh, but we have in his own words what he means by deconstruction as precise as a deconstructionist can be because after all, if you are a deconstructionist, you can hardly give a stable definition of a practice whose job it is to destabilize texts and their claims. So that's just uh, briefly my, um, okay, yeah, okay, so yes, uh, yes, because they are his contemporaries also, but that is the milieu in which he comes of age, right? The kind of literature that is being produced. So uh, yes, the absurdist, the early postmodernists, look at the 60s literature and what is coming out, and then the kind of philosophies that is coming out. Foucault is producing, Deleuze is producing, Merleau-Ponty has already produced, um, his major works. So yes, I mean, even if he doesn't talk about these uh, writers directly, that is the epoch in which Derrida is emerging as a thinker. So yes, absolutely, I'm glad you mentioned that. We'll try to go into a little bit of detail of uh, Plato's pharmacy. Please do read it. We can't really cover it in one class session, but it's a good text to read and struggle through. And then we will conclude our discussion of Derrida on Wednesday. That's all I have. If you have any questions, I'll wait for a few minutes after this. But if there are no questions, I will sign off. But thank you so much for today. And I hope you are safe and staying safe. And I will see you all next time.